My name is Anna Glava and I work as a policy advisor for Africa Gruppena based in Stockholm. So this webinar is co-hosted and arranged by Africa Gruppena and HIV Plus, HIV Plus. Um, Africa Gruppena is a feminist neighbor based solidarity organization working on development cooperation in Southern Africa with a focus on fair power structures and fair distribution of resources. We also support the struggle for a free Western Sahara. Our vision is a just world and we act in solidarity with people in the struggle to fight poverty and other injustices. We act to change the conditions causing inequalities in the global economic system. And uh, Africa Group and us partner organizations are based in Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, and also regionally. And uh, HIV Plus is uh, the World AIDS Day Network campaign unit for spreading knowledge and awareness about HIV. The network started approximately 20 years ago and is active in the Gothenburg region on the west coast of Sweden. Members in the network are both NGOs, the municipality and the health department of the region. Uh, the network is working norm consciously and rights based to reduce discrimination and exclusion of people living with HIV. And Africa Group and as local group in Gothenburg is an active member of this network. So the idea for this uh, webinar that we have today came from the network wanting an international perspective on the struggle. And since Africa Group and us local group is a member of the network, they turned to us interested to learn more about the situation in Southern Africa. So with us today, we have three amazing activists with a wealth of experience from working with HIV in Malawi and South Africa. Uh, firstly, Sharon Ekambaram is a human rights activist involved in the struggle for social justice through her work. She was one of the founding members of the Treatment Action Campaign and later worked with the AIDS Consortium in the struggle for affordable treatment for people living with HIV and AIDS, and later against AIDS denialism of the South African government. She is current head of the Refugee and Migrant Rights Program at Lawyers for Human Rights. Also with us today, we have Sibongile Shibui Zingini, who is an activist with broad professional experience in building movements, feminist advocacy, conflict management, HIV and AIDS management, and capacity building, to mention a few. During her 14 years of experience working with women, she has worked with Malawi Network of People Living with HIV and AIDS as a program officer responsible for gender mainstreaming and women and girls' rights. She has also worked with Malawi Network of Religious Leaders living with or affected by HIV and AIDS as a program officer. She has brought this experience to build the Our Bodies, Our Lives campaign in Malawi and has also helped in building movements in the region. Sibungile Chabalala is the national chairperson of the Treatment Action Campaign, a well-known community activist and representative of the people living with HIV sector. Sibongili worked for the Treatment Action Campaign for many years and as a community liaison officer at Right to Care, she is the General Secretary of the five national organizations of people living with HIV and is also living openly with HIV. Sibongili serves at the Global Fund Country Coordinating Mechanism representing people living with HIV, is a board member of the Rural Health Advocacy Project and is an honorary fellow at the Steve Biko Center for Bioethics. And according to the program, we should also have had uh, Pumi Mutetwe from Jazz with us today, but unfortunately she had to, to cancel her participation today, but we will carry on without her. Um, and with that introduction um, of our guests and the organizations, I'd now like to hand over the word to Sharon, please. Thank you very much. Um, if you could please upload my presentation. Oh, 
Okay, so I, um, I'm, I'm doing this as a, as um, you know, individual, as an organization uh, working for Lawyers for Human Rights. Um, I, we formed uh, Kopenang Africa Against Xenophobia, which Comrade Sibongile Shabalala has also been involved in. And I think this, just to give you some context, uh, currently in South Africa and you know, actually over a number of years now, we have seen the, the horrific uh, scenes of xenophobic violence that uh, takes place targeting predominantly black African brothers and sisters from the African continent coming to South Africa, seeking refuge, many of them uh, wanting protection as refugees or uh, so-called economic um, migrants. And I, I will be speaking a bit to this in uh, what is more a overview of so the, the, the challenges and the crisis that we're facing in, in Southern Africa, but probably Sub-Saharan Africa in, 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 and putting that in a global context. And so while I'll speak initially to some of the lessons that we could have learned from our experience of, of uh, AIDS denialism and the struggles against uh, the big pharmaceutical manufacturing association. Um, currently, we are facing um, you know, a serious crisis and in particular in South Africa, um, as one of the most unequal societies in the world, we are uh, seeing the, um, this phenomenon of, 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 of violence. Uh, whether it's the food riots that took place in June last year uh, with scenes of, of shops being burnt and, and, and uh, so-called looting, or as I mentioned, the, the xenophobic violence, but what is also of, of ongoing concern in our country um, is gender-based violence and, and hate crimes in, in, in that sense. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that, you know, if I could sum up what for me were some of the major achievements of the struggles to uh, address the HIV AIDS pandemic is that it shifted it, shifted the disease uh, from being one of uh, something that individuals were being blamed for on moral grounds. Uh, we saw terrible stigma in our country and, and I think that some, some of the great achievements of the Treatment Action Campaign was to identify that it was an issue of, of uh, politics, it was about poverty, uh, and it was also about the fact that there are uh, deep divisions and discrimination in our society that fuels um, pandemics like the HIV AIDS pandemic, the TB pandemic, and, and I think one of the major achievements of the Treatment Action Campaign was to show us how law and politics can be used as a means to fight for justice and for social justice. And, uh, and that became a, um, a way to galvanize society, um, leading with people living with HIV as activists and not as victims. Um, and in being empowered with knowledge, with the science of HIV, and also very importantly, how to live positively in spite of the inequalities and, and the discrimination and, and how TAC countered that. And it continues to do this work at grassroots level of uh, education and mobilizing to be informed. And I will speak a bit about this as a bigger challenge uh, facing South Africa today and probably uh, globally with respect to, I would say, democracy in crisis. And I think the other big uh, achievement of the TAC was to galvanize an international global movement uh, against the multinational corporates. And I think that this global campaign, uh, you know, uh, popularizing uh, posters with, with hands bleed, with hands, uh, you know, with blood dripping, how the pharmaceuticals are putting profits before lives. 
uh, was was instrumental in in getting uh, the the uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers association to withdraw its its uh, intention to take the South African government to court uh, because it was considering using um, you know uh, policies like the parallel importation and 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 uh, 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 you know others in in, in you know, countering in a way the patent act to ensure that life-saving drugs was going to be made available for people living with HIV and, and, and TB. And, and, and of course, that would have an impact more broadly. And, and as I said earlier on, in, in some work that was defined by uh, Paul Farmer, where he spoke about infections and inequalities and the diseases that were not to be uh, the responsibility of an individual, but located in society and located in the inequalities in society, and you know where we put people's lives uh, um, uh, 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 secondary to the drive and incentive for for profits. Um, and and we can see, and I'm sure uh, Comrade uh, Sibongile Shabalala will speak about the fact that we are still struggling with a TB pandemic, where it, we know it's a curable disease. And, and uh, we haven't come, uh, you know, addressed properly the, the HIV AIDS pandemic as well. And Southern, Southern Africa is still the epicenter of, of both these, these diseases. Next slide, please. So these are some of the posters that the Treatment Action Campaign produced, which I think uh, was able to um, target uh, companies and individuals, and, and which was uh, incredibly uh, successful in the use of media and education in, in uh, you know, getting a, a global movement um, that was uh, under the leadership of people living with HIV to raise the, the, the immorality of the, the way in which uh, Big Pharma was making profits out of um, uh, diseases like HIV and, and, and TB. Next slide, please. So this was actually uh, targeted at the Swedish fighter plane. This is uh, another example of uh, AIDS profiteer uh, and, and Pfizer. And, and, uh, and this was a big campaign around a fluconazole, which TAC identified as, as uh, you know, before we actually um, took our government to court uh, at the stage where people were dying from a curable thing like thrush and where they were being given a mycostatin to cure thrush and, and, and whereupon um, treatment was needed uh, like fluconazole and, and diflucan. And um, the treatment action campaign, um, you know, eventually had a defiance campaign where we brought in generic drugs from Thailand, from Brazil, in partnership and collaboration with international movements like uh, Doctors Without Borders, and demonstrated that these drugs, while I think Pfizer, if I remember, was charging about 20 rand for a pill, and we could get it from um, Thailand for as little as two rand. And I think these strategies and, and the way in which TAC was able to expose the, the, the you know, who the, the, the the enemy was, if you like, uh, was incredible in, in bringing the, the, the arguments around why we, we need a movement that is addressing these inequalities. And it's not a natural phenomenon that we're seeing the large numbers of people, thousands of people uh, dying uh, and, and, and whereupon there was treatment that, that would be able to uh, allow them to live in dignity and, and extend their lives. The next slide, please. And this was against uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, an AIDS profiteer, and, and the hands was the famous uh, posters that TAC uh, produced, uh, putting profits before lives. And, and making a very sound argument, always based on science, that it wasn't against making profits. So if you wanted to make profits from Levi jeans or from diamonds or you know things that are not life-saving, that, 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 the, the argument was about the immorality of making profits where people could not afford the treatment in order to live. And I think that that was a, a huge success in how, how TAC uh, very strategically um, 
uh, built its 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 uh, campaigns. Uh, next slide, please. And so this was, of course, part of an ongoing campaign. And and um, uh, Mr. Larry Kramer, who actually died in 2020, I think it was, um, uh, at an age of 85, he was one of the leaders who really. Um, was a turning point in, in uh, civil society, I would say, in, in, in America, where it was seen as a gay disease and it was, uh, you know, very, very uh, moralistic in the way that uh, the, the government and the whole response to the AIDS pandemic in its early days and, and a very critical uh, contribution uh, through the formation of, of ACT UP and other organizations, Health Gap, who we have continued to have partnerships with um, in, in turning that whole uh, situation around and, and again, uh, making it about the uh, exposing um, the high costs of drugs that was actually the cause of people dying as opposed to their sexual orientation or, you know, uh, uh, which was often uh, how the, the, the world was able to, or, uh, you know, uh, governments and states where we're neglecting this this huge pandemic uh, by by um, um, moralistic statements and 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 their prejudice. Next slide, please. So I think I'm um, coming. Uh, my last few slides will just deal with trying to locate this and and how I think we have we've not taken any pages out of the book of of you know the the struggles that that formidable organizations like the Treatment Action Campaign won. And I think in retrospect, it looks as though it was very easy, but uh, Sibongile can speak to you about uh, the sacrifice it took and what it took to build a movement at grassroots level. It wasn't just leaders who were able to articulate arguments and engage with government. But if you walked into any of the, the townships that were affected, you'd find a branch or you'd find regions of people who were studying as if they were at school, learning about what is a patent, what is parallel importation, what is HIV, and, and learning the science of our bodies and how the virus was affecting our body, infecting our body, and, 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 and basically going back to school to, uh, to counter the kind of, of uh, denialism that was, was at the time being uh, um, you know, pro, uh, our state and, and, and government leaders. So I think that you know it, it, we continue, and I, I feel we haven't learned lessons as we struggle with the COVID pandemic in South Africa and probably in the region as well. We have seen the disproportionate impact of COVID, the regulations, the actual uh, how it's affecting and 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 mortality rates uh, disproportionately affecting poor, predominantly black uh, uh, people and 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 women. Um, and and uh, we have failed to uh, hold our government to account to be able to ensure that there is redress for our, our dark past of apartheid, uh, where there was unfair privilege and those divisions continue. So you'd see that race and gender domination is largely undisturbed post the 1994 dispensation gender-based violence, xenophobia, and, and the food rights that I referred to in my introduction that took place in June last year, continues to engulf our communities. And, and, and the number of, the, there's a growing gap between the richest and the poorest and the, and the impact of, of these uh, communicable diseases, as I pointed out, uh, based on the conditions that people are living under because of uh, you know, systemic unemployment. And so, you know, while COVID may not be airborne like, like uh, diseases like TB, there is lessons that we could learn, we could have learned in, in uh, mitigating against the way in which it has been spread uh, to try and bring it under control. And I think just a very brief point, which I think requires much more discussion, is the climate crisis and its disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable in society. And I think, you know, the, the whole notion of movement of people in this era uh, and, and how that is uh, impacting on our ability to bring uh, communicable diseases under control. And I think just to really emphasize the point that it's not that migrants spread diseases, that there is a critical need for, in the context of movement, 
to look at how we, had, uh, uh, we respond to these diseases in, in, as a region, as opposed to criminalizing movement and pushing people underground, we are not going to bring uh, diseases like COVID or, um, uh, or TB uh, under control, uh, which for key is for people to come forward, to be open, to not be afraid of, of repression or, or stigma as, as TAC very powerfully demonstrated over the, the decades that it has been uh, um, functioning and, and, and building on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. So I think, you know, uh, from where we're sitting in, in Southern Africa, it does appear as though we're living in a, in a major crisis in a, globally. Uh, and, and I think the, the killings in America, the war uh, and, and, and the ongoing living, the kind of uh, restrictions imposed by the COVID pandemic. Uh, and, and on top of that, we continue to see the, the, the impact of, of, of diseases like HIV and TB in our communities and the rise of, of the kind of violence that we've, um, we've experienced. And I think what is needed desperately uh, under the leadership of organizations like TAC and other uh, uh, movements is to be able to hold our governments at all levels to account by informed communities. And I think that's what I've tried to map out in, in TAC's very strategic ap approach is to ensure that it, it, it had a membership that was fully informed um, and, and could speak about every aspect of HIV, whether it's who produces AZT and what profits they're making uh, to the basic science of, of HIV, how it's spread and how it impacts on our body. And I think that key is that we should be building national and international public health systems that can adequately reduce, detect, and respond to natural disaster, disease outbreaks, but also industrial chemical spills and the kind of uh, challenges that the climate crisis, as well as uh, you know the, the 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 growing impact of, of global monopolies on 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 communities and 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 um, in in terms of the destruction it's it's um, um, meeting out on 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 our planet. Um, then I think what is needed more than ever is a coherent cross-border vision and movement of the poorest, the working, formal or informal, and the principles of inclusivity and, and, and being non-binary in, 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 in addressing the kind of uh, crises that, that are throwing communities into disarray and in, in an extreme suffering and, and, and poverty. Um, I'm not sure if I've got one more slide. Oh, this is my last slide. Yes, that was my last slide. And I think, you know, I was trying to map out what, what the challenges are going forward. And, and in, a, in, a, in a global context, with, uh, with social media, with access to the kind of information that we're able to get in, in, in the current era, I, I feel that um, the forces of evil have dominated and used social media for their interests in spreading misinformation and using algorithms and, 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 and indoctrinating young people uh, and, and our job um, as activists, as people to build a global movement for change is, is um, we really need to think about how can we be inspired by things like the Arab Spring to build a movement for good and for change in the world as we see the continuing impact of, of consumerization and, and, and profiteering at, at the expense of lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, um, for that very interesting session. Um, yes, so now it's time to move on to Sibongile Singini. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving us a chance to really speak about our experiences that we have gone through uh, in Malawi. Uh, I think as regards to the 40 years uh, living with HIV. Uh, just Southern Africa has been active in feminist movement building in Southern Africa since 2007. 
And our goal is to build women's collective power for justice. That is our main purpose uh, globally. And we are achieving um, our goal through these strategies. Uh, the first one is we are developing women readership or women readers so that wherever they are, they can have the skills to work with each other in a collective way. We are also building cross-movement networks uh, along uh, the communities that we work with and in the countries that we work with. We are also amplifying grassroots feminist stories. So we, we really target this because we want people to learn from the experiences that uh, women have uh, from the grassroots. And we also believe that the women have knowledge on, what, on whatever solutions they want to bring in, into their lives. We also document activist insights so that uh, we use that as a learning uh, point, as uh, Shalon was also talking about uh, her presentation, I think she also mentioned about the insights that activists, I think, um, did uh, at that time with TAC. We also influence policy. That is the whole aim of uh, our movements. We want to transform the negative powers. So let me just tell you about the story of our bodies, our lives. Uh, we have a movement in Malawi, which started in 2006. Uh, it started as an effort to support and facilitate the greater participation of women living with HIV in all matters affecting their lives. So we saw that there were so many issues and we said, no, let's gather, let's be together and make sure that uh, we support each other so that we have something uh, that we will point out and say, we, we were here, we did this together and these are the results of the collective uh, organizing that we're doing. So that's how uh, our movement, which we are calling our bodies, our lives started. And uh, we start, what, how, we, how we did it was we started with, I think there were 25 women leaders in 2007 and we started as an individual. What we normally do is when we are uh, giving out the knowledge or when we are training, we use uh, some tools that we have when we are training. And uh, what we normally start with is raising the consciousness of every person so that you know who you are, what you can do and what you can do with others so that you can help each other uh, in bringing the transformation that you want as a group. Yeah, so we do this in order to build the collective power and also the voice, which is not really there uh, in Southern Africa. We are not encouraged to voice out if we have issues as Africans, if I can use that word. We are used to normalizing violence. And if you are a woman and people see you voicing out, they will label you with so many names. And you will be silenced by those labeling. And then you will just say, okay, let me just sit back and see how the government will help us. So when we are giving out our education, we make sure that we build the collective power because we know that if we act together, I think we will all be safe. Security will be there and we will be protected. As we are doing this in a, that in a collective way, that's how now we start voicing out in a collective way with the goal of transforming the structural drivers of discrimination that is here in Africa, the inequalities that is here in Africa, the violence that is here in Africa, more especially, I think, in 2007, when stigma was so lapped in Africa, this really helped us as women to come as one in a collective to voice out in a movement that we call Our Bodies, Our Lives. And we called this movement Our Bodies, Our Lives because we, th we thought of our own lives. We knew that there are so many companies, many organizations that are doing work uh, with people living with HIV. But for us, we focused on women bodies. 
And we knew that the, the whole body was given a woman's face. And we said, no, let's accept this and also talk about it and give our movement, our name, ourselves. That's why we are calling it our bodies, our lives. So the actions may differ. At this time, we were fighting for better ARVs but it may differ, we may fight for economic justice, uh, climate crisis, and anything that uh, affects our body. So the name will still be the same, but the actions that will be happening will be different. So our lives in Malawi, uh, I think I will talk as a woman, uh, but I'll also talk of where Malawi is. Uh, we are the most poorest country and we depend on aid, on almost everything. So you, you can imagine a country depending on aid, on everything that you want to do in that country. And this gave no choice for our government to accept the most toxic ARVs, the drugs that we were getting, which was trimune 30 and 40, which was giving us a lot of side effects. When I tell you about a lot of side effects, and as women, we cherish our bodies, we love our bodies, but these drugs that were given to us, they really deformed our bodies. And because of this, because the drug was toxic, the toxic, uh, we had a lot of side effects and the impacts were very bad. Um, we noticed that there were a lot of uh, divorce, by that time, marriages were breaking just because of how I was looking. Uh, the other thing was stigma and discrimination. We were not even able to go to, to church. Church was worse. The stigma that was at church, the preaching, if they just see you how you are looking, the preaching will change. And they will talk about you as if you are a prostitute. There was so much for us. And life was not good at that time. Poverty and so many things. Yeah. So these were the things that shaped um, our organizing. And then we said, I think stigma and discrimination is too much. We have to do something. There is a lot of inequalities, more especially between men and women. And even between the key pop, it was too much the discrimination was too much. And we said, no, this is an issue for us, which we have to stand up and start organizing. The issue of women not finding jobs because of how they look, it was too lampant. If they just see you maybe being sick for a week, for a month, two, two months, the third month, you are out of that job. It, it was too much, it was too much. And the poverty levels were high because the bodies were weak. Women were not able to go to, to gardens to do their farming because of the side effects that were coming because of uh, the ARVs that uh, we were taking. The other thing was lack of uh, knowledge because there, we didn't really had enough knowledge on HIV and AIDS by that time it was very difficult for women to adhere to drugs because others were saying, uh, they think the study effects are too much, they will just stop. Uh, but we tried to encourage each other, but over there was really something that also pushed us uh, to shape our organizing and then to be where we are as of now. Yeah, so these struggles, uh, I've talked about Ed in Malawi, and, of, and also the uh, lives that he, women were living uh, as of that time. Um, the other thing that really is an issue until now is depending on age, which affects our lives. It also affects our bodies until now. And it is also affecting everything that we do as people and also as, as women. Uh, the other issue that we are also facing is, uh, I think for women, for us to access uh, funding or even for the lending institutions to give us maybe loans, it's, it's very difficult. 
the quality of that they're talking about, you should have a house, you should have land, you should have this. It's very difficult for uh, maybe a woman living with HIV to really have a chance uh, to be e economically empowered because of the procedures or the policies that are there that hinder us to really have what we want to have. The other thing that is also an issue here is our health systems. We have a lot of uh, issues and problems with our uh, health systems, more especially in hospitals. We don't have medication. You, you can be sick, not only with HIV. You can receive your ARV drugs, but if you are sick with malaria or if you are having sugar or all that, you, you will not find anything. You will just... Uh, be told that please go back and buy this on your own. So with the poverty levels that we are living in, it's very difficult. It's now 40 years down the line, we are still saying the same issue, issues. So what we really want to do as women is to continue building collective power to be safe, sufficient, but we need help. We have started, but we need help. Because what we want to do now is to start taking care of one another. We have been depending on governments for so long. We have been advocating, we have been doing a lot of things, but things are not working out. What we women are looking for now from different levels is to be self-sufficient and to take care of one another and maybe a solidarity message maybe from the women is to free us from aid. I don't know what will happen. So that's the question for all of us. Um, the other thing is it, it's in inadequate knowledge in HIV as I already talked about it. Despite continued awareness and funding, we still need to raise more awareness on HIV treatment and management because if we leave this out, it will remain a problem. Inadequate facilities for cancer screening. This is something that is just coming in, not very new, but a lot of women living with HIV are dying because of cancer. And this is a big, big issue for women living with HIV and just any other women. We need facilities for this. Inadequate awareness on SRHR. This is a big issue, which is leading to high vulnerabilities, including unplanned pregnancies and also new infections of HIV and also structural violence. Structural violence is a big issue that is also hindering the work that we are doing in Malawi, which also includes gender-based violence. So our political aims are, are that we want to end discrimination and stigma and homophobia. Because the, these two are really hindering, I think, the efforts that we have been uh, working in countries and also in communities. And most of the times when stigma is there, when discrimination is there, when homophobia is there, this discourages individuals from seeking testing, prevention and treatment services from hospitals. Because people are living in fear. They can't get out of the hiding places where they are because of homophobia, because of stigma. It seems as if some, as if it is something very simple, but when we talk of stigma and discrimination, I'm telling you, this is a big stress. The universal health coverage, we just talk about this, but it is needed for everyone in each country. In Southern Africa, it, is, it was needed yesterday, but we can't have this. The services that we have are not sufficient and we need to have this for everyone without governments going into debt. And this is very important 
and maybe my question should be what should government do for them to have domestic funding in their own countries for for example i think i'll talk more about malawi because we don't have our own domestic funding and we depend on it on on everything so this is a big issue Agent concerns that are happening now, such as climate change, uh, I think uh, Sharon talked about this and its effect on migration. These are big issues that we have to think about when we are also uh, dealing with issues of HIV. Food insecurity, very, very big issues that are coming because of climate crisis. Water resources. Until now, in Malawi, we have so many communities that, that are taking and safe water. And if we deal with this, I think we may start living in a world that is just for us all. And HIV pandemic cannot be brought under control without recognizing and ensuring the human rights for all. And we have been singing this song all this time. I think we really need to act on this. And if it continues to be a struggle, uh, it, it will continue to be a struggle if we will not really tackle the right to health. And if we don't acknowledge who is at risk for the infection with HIV, we will also continue uh, to talk about the same issues of HIV, maybe the next, the next 40 years to come. Because we have those that are key or those that are at risk for, for HIV infection. But what our governments are doing is they're shutting those people down. And the, we are concentrating maybe on other things. Yeah, so if we start really uh, looking and, and, and really doing something on, the, on those that are at risk, I think things will really change. Yeah, I think as I'm also concluding my, my, my presentation, I also have two questions for us all. One is what I already talked about, free us from aid. The other one is, what does it mean for these uh, different pandemics that we are going through now and the disasters that are coming at once as regards to HIV? I think we all know that now we are talking of monkeypox, COVID, climate crisis, what does this mean to us all? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sibongile. Um, with those ending questions and conclusion, we take them forward uh, and bring them with us uh, in the next session in the following in the following part of the seminar and i will now hand over to sibongile thank you another <laughs> sibongile um good day uh, everyone um i think i'll speak more on what was happening on the because already Sharon was talking more on the leadership level, and I think he shares a good background on top of what was happening in the country at the leadership, at the leadership level. Now to consider what's happening in the ground. So, <clears throat> as it was indicated in my bio, I'm one of the people. Who is, who is living openly with HIV, and I was diagnosed in the time when ARVs were not a country. So as I'm talking here, I was actually affected by not having ARVs. So that while 
uh, from the were making money and while the fight was pushing. And uh, she, she also said, I'm going to speak about sacrifice. And um, it was amazing. Uh, she spoke a bit about treatment was about teaching people about the science of HIV, how HIV enters the world, and how to how manage to link a, 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 a legal, legal information with science because in most, uh, when you talk to academics, they tell you that those are two different things and they can't talk to each other in terms of, in, of uh, um, in terms of uh, 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 the way they are structured. But now, when you Sorry, speak about, uh, yes. Can I, could I ask you to maybe try and switch off your camera because the network is a bit wobbly. Maybe, oh, okay. maybe that's better. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, it's okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. It, is it better now? Okay. So as she was talking about what was happening on the ground, what to mobilize people who live while at science of HIV, we will also use the, the constitution of the country, the legal point of how we have remember that time, we were just after uh, uh, um, the 1994 elections, we just got from, and most of the people still in the uh, uh, communities, most people were still illiterate, most people wouldn't even understand the science, the, 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 the names that are called in science, maybe you put a viral load to speak on for content. It's which two people on. So when you talk of this ground, to say people with HIV on the ground, it was at that time as Bongile said that there's discrimination, there's a lot of stigma, and there was a lot of labeling. We were also facing on the ground, and churches were against what was happening because they believe that people living with HIV, they because they are sex workers or they because they are partners. So there was no information. In families, it was difficult because in other areas, you family will not accept a person living with HIV and they wouldn't even understand to say can a, 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 a infect us by drinking in the same cup and sleeping in the same bed or using uh, one toilet. It was not a problem. But people were made to live like monkeys where people will be built shacks outside where they will be if they are not human beings where they can put one plate that would be washed using all um, all kinds of of of, of dish water and everything and it was really difficult but also elders were taking advantage of the people on the ground to say we can cure hiv so to mobilize people to say you need to understand the science of hiv you need to come and understand that the treatment literacy, what does it mean to have HIV, how to survive with HIV, how to disclose your stigma. It wasn't is because people died. We know that Kukulta died because she was the first woman who came out and stayed on the ground. And the community turned against the very same person that she, she was living with, and they killed her. Those were challenges that were living on the ground. But mobilizing and continuing to come to, 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 to low sectors is what for us to uh, lobby uh, sectors and other people on the ground so that we can be able to decide HIV. Then if smaller is coming to the traditional healing 
I think I'm 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 bewitched because this is happening to me. The traditional healer will be able to identify to say this person has symptoms of being HIV positive of or AIDS and can refer the person to the hospitals. So those were the challenges that we were facing before the fight, before we were ARVs. I won't talk on how we asked to have ARVs before we just spoke about that. But what are we doing now as, as being with HIV? We are facing stigma, are still facing discrimination. I'm saying this in terms of a uh, mostly key population, sex workers, LGBTIs, uh, men sleeping with uh, men. They are young people are not comfortable to go to facilities or clinics to access their medication there because our medication, our clinics are nearer to our communities and mostly uh, the, 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 the trans LGBTIs, when they go to facilities, they'll face discrimination where they'll be asked to say, are you a, a male or are you a female? Why are you looking like? And they will call each other and they will make a lot of things. Uh, we have learned from COVID, which is very uh, important that uh, if our government, it affects them, they take a pillars and they make sure that resources are available. It does affect them. They take their time, they take uh, uh, things likely. Because it was keeping more uh, uh, people from a uh, rich countries, killing everyone, most politicians, most people on the it was also people on the ground, but in that governments can together, they can be able to mobilize resources, they can be able to give services to the people as 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 as, as, as they, can. they can make sure that things can be done. Uh, the resources they were, were, were mobilized uh, in COVID, it took a short space of time to fight COVID and to make sure that vaccines are available and all those things. The question that we need to ask, why we, it didn't happen with that, like that for people living with HIV, why we had to wait uh, for more than 10 years as people living with HIV to access ARVs. And while we were, we were, we were I'm still talking about uh, COVID, we have seen a lot of uh, as, uh, uh, disrespect and, 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 and a, 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 a disclosure of 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 people living with HIV because people with HIV we treated badly. I mean, when you go to facility, you were forced to disclose data by that which is happening now. And when you go to facility because of COVID, cues had separated. Now the nurse will stand there and those who are here for their ARVs wait, those who are here for uh, their chronic medication, or those who are just sick, they should wait. Which is, the people stop eating the ARVs because it was, they were in uncomfortable clothes, but still dispose their status for the affair. And also what, some facility you are breaking so up hi you are breaking up a lot now up. and it's really we're struggling to to hear you unfortunately um, and i'm not sure what to do <laughs> i'm even not sure what to do because just in my home um um i don't know what to do yeah, maybe can you um, hear me now? It's it's breaking up all the time actually. But maybe mm -hmm. can we try and if we do like this, if you log out and log in again, maybe that could help. I have no idea, but we can try and we can okay. try and address uh, one question from the audience while you are trying to connect again. Okay. Thank you. Let I'm really sorry. That.
So I will start with the first question then from Joachim. He's asking, how do you make people with HIV coming forward and work against stigma for people living with HIV? Sibungile or Sharon, do you? Yeah, maybe Sibungile. Okay, let me just start, then Sharon will, will come in. Yeah, I think he, uh, right now, um, uh, we are coming together and we have developed a lot of support groups. There are coalitions that are also working with people living with HIV, movements like what we have formed and, 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 and we advocate for HIV uh, issues. Uh, right now, I think we also advocated for involvement of people living with HIV. Uh, at all levels, uh, and and for us, we asked uh, the Minister of Health to involve uh, those that are living with HIV to be expert clients uh, when there are issues in the community, so that uh, they can maybe uh, others can also learn from what these uh, expert clients have gone through and uh, how they can still uh, live with their life. Uh, I think for Malawi, we have also lobbied and advocated. Uh, for the uh, HIV and AIDS Prevention and Management Bill, uh, which we started in 2008, but it came to pass in 2017. Yeah, so yeah, I think this, these are some of the wins that we have been doing. And right now, uh, what we have also started doing is uh, working uh, with, 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 uh, with, with, with people living with HIV, but not only focusing on HIV, but also focusing on health and well-being, and also including issues of food, economic justice, GBV, land, because this form uh, part of health and well-being that we talk about is just, uh, and not really focusing only on HIV. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't see Sibongile being back yet, so we can take also. Are there any networks like HIV Plus working in South Africa, I think, the SA or Southern Africa? Uh, and do people talk about HIV more openly nowadays, or is there still a huge stigma? Well, maybe I can start and then uh, Sibongila, you can, can add. I think that uh, in terms of networks, yes, there's a number of organizations. There is also, uh, I think, you know, some of the support that the, the government is providing. Um, it, it's much more constructive to work with the government that has um, accepted. And we have a national strategic plan um, on dealing with HIV and, 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 and TB. Uh, we have, as, as uh, comrades uh, Sibongile Shabalala mentioned, a, a national association of people living with HIV. We have the Positive Women's Network. There is quite a number of organizations that, that have formed. And I, um, and I think that um, that has strengthened the response uh, but there is still a stigma. And I think that, uh, you know, a very powerful point that uh, Comrade Sibongile and Singini uh, pointed out is the normalization of violence and how that silences people and how we do not speak out. And, and I think that the, for me, the biggest contribution to stigma is uh, located in uh, the discrimination and uh, living in a patriarchal society. I think that the powers uh, and, and the way in which the abuse that of those powers takes place has significantly um, uh, impacted, particularly in the private space of a home. And so I think while in society, we've built movements, we've engaging with with authorities and, and various uh, 
places where you know targeting the pharmaceuticals and stuff but at the at the uh, in the home is where many many uh, people are uh, being um, th this continues to be homophobia transphobia uh, and 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 violence against uh, a women so i think that that and that often results in people not wanting to come forward and speak about their status and and getting help and support and and a lot more work needs to be done in in that sense in in dealing with with uh, patriarchy thank you sharon um sibungila let's try again and see if the connection okay. is better yeah um i'm not sure can you hear me now is it better yeah, let's try. Okay. So because of maybe time and some of the questions I think Sharon has just uh, 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 spoke about, I think it's important also to me to speak about in the country. Uh, according to the stats that I have, in 2019, only in South Africa, a, a TB has, has killed 36,000 people. And that also, I want to link it to the, to the issue of resource mobilization, where we see people, resource uh, may, uh, governments be able to be able to get resources to COVID, but unable a uh, 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 TP in South Africa, which also not in South Africa or only in Southern Africa, which also tells more people than what COVID has done. So what mostly people who are mostly affected on the ground now, uh, as, as Sharon has, has spoke about the issues of patriarchy and other things, we are seeing more young people being infected with HIV, we are seeing more young people being neglected by the system because there are no youth friendly services for them. They can't go to facilities because the, the, the staff attitude is very bad towards them. But also what is more uh, depressing is the issue of on, on, on ongoing uh, shortages of contraceptives uh, uh, people, especially people, and ongoing uh, uh, shortages of coming to Africa or in, in South and in other countries. I'm not going to talk but we are like if we are in xenophobia, which we fighting that in that way, and most people are women, the women who are coming for and are women who uh, cannot be able to be assisted uh, 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 easier. When you have to give birth, you have to pay, that, pay about 8,000 rand uh, uh, as a woman. So what I will try to say in closing is that uh, as much as I, if I remember very well the, the, that question, it was saying people know more about HIV. Yes, it's true on the grassroots, people know more about HIV, but the services are not as equal as people know more about HIV. But also now we are seeing uh, 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 the system that also takes people back to, to, to the eras where people, HIV were not available. Because once you miss your appointment in the facility for your ARVs, you'll be treated as you, you, you committed a huge crime. You'll be taken back to the queue and you'll be assisted last and you'll be shouted at by, by nurses in front of everyone. So most people are not comfortable now to go to facilities. As much as treatment campaign and its partners fought for ARVs, ARVs are, are there, but the, 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 the healthcare system is breaking down. As Bongila spoke about uh, 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 the issues of cancer uh, and women living with HIV, we are also seeing that uh, in South Africa and services for cancer, not only for people living with HIV are very near and we are willing and we are talking to government that are, are ready to, to, to we just hospital that 
which has been on like that digital is the only digital that has oncology when people with HIV and who have cancer has to be referred to. I'm talking to you to say our government is saying they label that 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 hospital end of the treatment. That does what does that mean? means they care about us, it's about what they get in the pocket. Okay, unfortunately, the connection is really bad. And Sibongila disappeared for a moment, now she's back again, but I'm not sure if it's working. Um, can you hear me? So, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I will just end with the issue of corruptions uh, to say the money that are supposed to go to people on the ground and provide services are seeing day in day out leaders being held accountable stealing that money as i'm talking to you we know that our former uh, uh, health minister is in is in he has told about a few million that was to people to fight COVID, to to make sure that people are are, are, are catered for but it never happened so that's the crisis that we are at. So as much as we made this, but politicians and greedy governments and political will that is not there, it takes us also ten steps. Ahead. So we need uh, uh, um, we need to to mobilize more. We need to continue to fight. We need to uh, continue to be patient and fight moving forward in order for us to, to have better healthcare services, not only in South Africa, but in Southern, in Southern African countries, because what affects Zimbabwe affects South Africa, what affects Mau affects South Africa, what affects Swaziland, it affects South Africa. So we cannot discon disconnect from each other, but we need to come unite and mobilize and continue to fight. Thank you. Thank you, Sibongile, and I'm so sorry about the internet uh, connection issues. Uh, but thank you all very much for your really inspiring and interesting presentations. Um, we have one more question in the chat. Uh, it's Tommy who's asking, what are some of the main drivers going forward on a grassroots level? If anyone feel the urge <laughs> to reply. I think we've been speaking about it and I think the points that Comrade Sibungila just made, for me, um, what uh, uh, Comrade Singini uh, said about food insecurity is critical. That the climate crisis, uh, COVID, the regulations have thrown millions of people into uh, a, a crisis of food insecurity. And, and on top of that, we having systemic unemployment, the change in the nature of work. I think the other two big things is violence, gender-based violence, but just you know the kinds of violence that we're experiencing of, of xenophobic violence. And it appears as though political formations and the, the big man politics is what is driving the violence as well. Uh, for power and and corruption. Those will be my three. <laughs> yeah, maybe just to add on what Sharon has just said, I think we also have like of integrated sexual reproductive health rights and services in government programs. I think the whole Southern Africa that is really lacking. And it is one thing that is causing, I think the infections to really uh, go up. The other one is also the inadequate knowledge that we talked about, about treatment literacy. Awareness has happened, yes, but knowledge on, on types of drugs that we are getting, uh, the adherence 
you need to know why you have to ad adhere. So I think we really need uh, trainings in the treatment literacy. Uh, the other thing is also the attitudes of healthy uh, workers. I think this is a big deal in Southern Africa. I don't know what our problem is in Southern Africa. And also the healthy care systems itself, it's, it's in a mess. We don't know what our governments can, can really do. The other thing is, the, I think the other driver is, I think people's consciousness have not been raised. People need to know who they are, what they can do, and what they can do in a group. And I think these trainings are really needed uh, through feminist movement building. Uh, where uh, issues of uh, patriarchy, as Sharon talked about, issues of power analysis and all that, and how uh, we can transform power uh, from, starting from the ground to the upper level. I think uh, that is also needed. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure whether I will be audible. But um, you know uh, what also can assist us is the voices that are coming outside of Southern Africa and all the world and, and all the activists in the world. And these kind of webinars where we share information and write statement, you raise this to say, we know what is happening in Southern Africa. I think it will also assist us because uh, they are scared of being embarrassed and they know if we other countries, they know about this, they'll be, they'll be held accountable, by, but not by only the other governments, by, by the civil society uh, in the world. So that is why I always say, partnership with everyone in the world, all activists coming together and support each other in any struggle. Uh, I think it will also assist uh, uh, all the challenges that we have, not only in South Africa, but globally. Yeah, I very much agree. Uh, just um, looking at like you've all touched upon, the, the global struggle, the global unrest, the democracy in crisis all over the place in every part of the world, and inequality, you know, skyrocketing and increasing, and just the levels of gender-based violence also everywhere. I mean, Together, we what what the solution that Africa Group and also is trying to stress is that addressing power structures and fighting patriarchy and coming together in sessions like these, uh, sharing struggles and ideas for mobilization and you know just trying to cross fertilize the struggles because so many parts of the struggles are the same even though the contexts differ. Um, so I think that is a powerful because yeah, I mean obviously the 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 things that we are talking about is can somehow feel overwhelming and really depressing looking also at the global crisis that everything is just you know caving in around us but but the hope in this I think is the the joint struggle and the mobilization and the solidarity across borders that can be made possible if we meet and talk about these issues and strategize together. I think that is something that we should all take with us, um, even though context differs, of course. Um, I can't see any more questions in the chat because the, the last sort of questions we've already addressed, I think in, in your last sessions or in your last comments. So is there any, do you have any Sibungile, Sibungile and Sharon, do you have any last comments to for, for all of us here in Sweden? And I know that there are participants from, from Southern Africa as well uh, to take with us in this joint effort. Anyone can just grab the mic. Can I state while my network is not it's still uh, behaving? <laughs> um my last word uh, is that um, the struggle is not over yet. 
and uh, as activists all over the world, we need to we need to continue to fight. Uh, we are speaking about a lot of uh, challenges that we are talking about, and we cannot divide each struggle from each other. You cannot divide struggle of HIV from climate change. You cannot divide struggle of uh, climate change from gender-based violence and patriarchy that we are facing. You cannot divorce the struggle of xenophobia and poverty. Uh, so, you know, all, all these things, they, they, they talk together. So in most cases, what we, the mistake that we do as activists is to say, I'm just an health activist, and the other one is say, I'm an env environmental activist. But if you look at our challenges, are talking to each other, and they need us to all to work, to, work, to work together in order to, to get somewhere. We know that sometimes we won't find we won't get what we really want, but it will push uh, uh, our governments and also we'll be able to get somewhere in terms of uh, fighting for justice, fighting for people who are not able to fight for themselves and also fighting for young people mostly on the ground and learning from us as activists that are growing up. If, uh, if you can look at these panelists, uh, we are all over 40s, I'm, I'm definitely sure. And how, what, how, how are we mentoring young activists to, to continue with this? Because we might not win other struggles, but young activists need to be mentored so that they can be able to carry over the struggles that we are carrying now and be carried over to fight as we are continuing to fight. Thank you. Yeah, so just to add on what my, my name said, said, yeah, I think there is power in collective action and let's hold hands and do this together. Together we can. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I want to agree. I think it's a significant point that was raised around young people and the youth. Um, but I think that our we, we do need a global um, uh, movement that can um, halt the destruction that global uh, companies, global monopoly is wreaking and including its stranglehold over the media and the, the, the framing of things and how that is a major uphill battle uh, to, to struggle against about uh, you know, proper information, information that's based on science. We are that, we're fighting so many wars, but I think that for me, the biggest challenge, even when we look at something like xenophobia and, and othering and gender-based violence, um, the, the way in which the, the media frames things and in whose interest, and I think that that's still a battle that we, we haven't won. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And to my panelists, it was very, very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, I can only say the same. Thank you so much. Uh, incredibly inspiring presentations and struggles that you shared with us today. Thank you so much. Um, we will put this webinar also on our webpage and share it with, with you panelists, of course, uh, in order for more people to, to, to listen in and, and share your knowledge. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep up the struggle and continue to hold hands and move forward and not give up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.